What's up, guys? I'm Chris Holdsworth, and this is the MMA Rundown brought to you by FanDuel. We're going to talk about one topic for three minutes and then move on to the next one. Today, I'm joined by UFC women's strawweight Corey Poppins McKenna. Let's go. All right, first topic we're going to talk about is the Kamaro Usman TKO versus Gilbert Burns. He retained the welterweight belt, uh, and he looked uh, very good doing it. He was hurt in the first round. Uh, it's funny, I was listening to Gilbert Burns' interview. He was like, man, I went full Garbrandt on him. You know, like, never go full Garbrandt on him. You know, you got to learn how to control yourself. And uh, I felt like the experience with Usman um, just being rocked and weathered the storm, he was able to come out in those later rounds. And it looked like Gilbert was, like, slowing down a little bit to me. Um, and going into this fight, I thought Gilbert was going to pose a lot of, uh, you know, jiu-jitsu uh, threats and scenarios that Usman was going to have to get out of and kind of, uh, you know, see how Usman's jiu-jitsu was. But, man, he proved us wrong, and uh, he took him to those later rounds and dropped him with a jab, like, uh, dropped Gilbert with a jab and then just did some great TKO ground and pound action once he, once he hit the ground. Um, he called out Mazdaval right after that, which is pretty crazy because they already fought, so... Uh, probably big money fight that they're trying to get uh, lined up for the future. But what do you think, Poppins? What, uh, what do you take on uh, that main event this past weekend? Yeah, I think Usman's um, kind of like experience really kind of prevailed through that fight. Obviously, he didn't, you know, he had him rocked. He had him like in deep waters, but he also didn't rush in when he, he obviously, uh, when he rocked Burns. I think he stayed very calm and collected, didn't make any stupid mistakes by like diving into the guard or anything like that. So I think it was a very, uh, like you could tell he's kind of a veteran of the sport and he's been around for a while and had a lot of fights. Yeah, I liked when he was like just standing over that in that later round where he dropped him with the jab. Uh, he was standing over, he was just clearing the legs. He didn't even engage in the jiu-jitsu. Like you said, some people just like to jump into the guard. And, you know, I don't think that's a you know smart idea, especially when you have somebody rocked. Uh, I, I thought that was great tactics by Usman, clearing the legs and just dropping those straight punches straight down, not, not looping too much. They're coming straight down using gravity um, and, and then getting Gilbert to kind of bounce his head off the canvas, which is a, you know, a great way to get those uh, GMP punches. Yeah, I'll chime in. I thought it was pretty crazy. You know, I picked Usman in this fight, and to see him getting, you know, I thought he was about to get finished in that first round. Burns was all over him, going for the finish, going full Cody Garbrandt on him. <laughs> and so that was wild. I was super nervous for him. Um, so tell me what you guys think from a corner's perspective. Trevor Whitman saw that that jab was getting through. That left jab was, he had a five-inch reach advantage, and it was landing. And he ended up knocking him down with a southpaw jab. You know, that wasn't a, a, a right hook or anything. He went to southpaw stance and dropped him. So what do you think about the cornering, Chris being a cornerman, uh, to tell him to stay on the jab, stay on the jab? I think that's what helped him win the fight. Yeah, Trevor Whitman is uh, one of the best cornermen around, uh, one of the best coaches around. Uh, you know, I really like uh, his style. And, and you know, he, he's been consistent with his coaching. He's always at, you know, the, some of those main event fights and always working with some of the best uh, fighters and champs around. So that should be just a testament of, uh, you know, what he's doing with his uh, athletes and um a lot of it is, you know, a lot of jab work. You, you see Rose, like, she lands the jab a lot. She works off her jab, and, you know, it's great to see Usman, like, changing stances and, and using these uh, using his length and jab to, you know, get these good strikes and effective strikes off. And quickly, as we wrap this one, uh, the next fight is either going to be Jorge Masvidal, who he called out, or Usman is trying to, in the post-fight press conference, lure in GSP. You know, he hears the rumors that GSP wants one – is interested in possibly one more fight. It looks like it's Habib or nothing. But if you guys had your pick and to see who he fights next, would it be Habib or would it be a rematch versus Jorge? Corey, what do you think? Um, I like the Masvidal fight because obviously didn't, there wasn't much of a camp before that and obviously it was like a tough fight. So maybe like with a full fight camp and everything, it'd be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, I also know like Wonderboy's piped up and said, obviously he's the only one in the top five or, or whatever it is uh, to, to have not fought him. So you never know, you might see a completely different fight. Yeah, I think uh, the the Masvidal rematch uh, with him having a, a a stronger camp and a longer camp uh, is might be a, a different fight. I think it'll be different. Masvidal looked like he was slowing down a little bit later in those rounds and couldn't really stop a lot of those wrestling exchanges. And if you're not in like full fight shape, uh, you it's it's gonna be hard to wrestle and fight for five rounds straight, especially when you got a beast like Usman on top of you trying to take you down. So. I would like to see that that second fight with, you know, a better camp on Masvidal's side. All right, next topic we're going to talk about is Julian Marquez asks Miley Cyrus out on a date. 
And this is pretty funny because uh, I know Julian. I met Julian back uh, when we were fighting for the RFA. And, you know, we had we drove from like Nebraska or Kansas all the way to Nebraska. It's like an eight hour drive. And we were just stopping at all the gas stations, getting snacks and just, you know, he, he's a funny dude. So uh, I, I've been following him on social media. He's got some uh, he's a character and he pulls out some antics. And Miley, uh, he, he asked her to be his Valentine's in the post fight. And she said, shave an MC in your chest and i'm all yours and then what did you say Corey? he said uh he yeah, denies him and what did he say his response was you know his nickname is the cuban missile crisis and he said get a henna tattoo like tupac's thug life over your belly button of, of cuban missile strike crisis and uh and then we'll be valentine's and he'll shave the mc in his chest when he had this A-list celebrity, all she asked for was an MC shaved in his chest. Ruined it. And she, he would have flew out for a date with her in L.A. and they would have been Valentine's. He would have had his dream come true. But he pushed it too far. She's not going to take the time to get that on her stomach. And so it, it's a sad story. Corey, what do you think? He had his chance with her. And now the, the MMA community is going crazy. thinks that he dropped the ball. What do you think? Um, This is the one thing I didn't really have much of an opinion on. Uh, yeah, I mean, he... <laughs> Yep, yeah, sounds like he's uh, fumbled that one, but uh, you never know. Maybe maybe after the next fight, he can pull it back. I would have shaved the biggest MC in my chest possible. Do you, do you and have even, the chest hair? I don't know. I don't have the chest hair. <laughs> so it would have been, it would have, I would have just drew it in and act, act like it was just like shaved in there um, and, and got that date with Miley and uh, see where things went. But you messed that up, Julian. I think you try to push it a little bit too far. So maybe next time, take those those big opportunities. They come knocking. You got to take them. There you go, Miley Cyrus, if you're watching it. Chris Holdsworth's game. <laughs> I'll shave that MC. <laughs> there you go. And what do you guys, I want to get you guys' opinion. You know, we're seeing this more and more since they're on such a big stage. And you have this moment where you have these, you know, sometimes millions of eyeballs or hundreds of thousands of eyeballs on you. We see the um, people making call outs. Who was it that called out Meek Mill? Uh, that wanted to do a collaboration with them. That was the dude who dresses in the suits. Oh, yeah, uh, Kai uh, Williams. Williams, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Insane or, 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 yeah, I know exactly. Uh, Kalen Williams? Yeah, Kalen Williams, yeah, Chaos yeah. Williams. Yeah, That's yeah, right, Chaos yeah. Williams. And he's like, I want to get into the rap game. I want to do some collaborations. And then he had this connection with Meek Mill afterwards because they probably had a bunch of people reaching out to Meek Mill and retweeting him and asking him. So it really is a stage to ask for what you want. And I even saw, you know, Corey in her last fight, she took that stage and said, Dana, maybe a 50K bonus? And she threw it out there, and I loved it. Throw it out there, <laughs> put it out there in the world, and you never know. He might look back and say, hey, maybe she does deserve it. But uh, I, I like that you took that, that swing, Corey. That was cool. It's worth a try. I, I lost my ankle for it, so it's the least he could do. Yeah. Heck yeah. Maybe next time. Keep on pushing for that bonus. Those will be huge, and uh, the call-outs will keep coming, so they're fun to watch. All right, next topic we're going to talk about, Corey being a talented artist. Now, I think this is pretty cool because I, MMA fighters or martial artists in general are, you know, people don't know, but I think we're pretty creative. Uh, you know, we fight, and it's kind of the way we express our art. Like, I know when I was fighting, I was like, this is my art. Like, this is my canvas. I'm going to I'm gonna try to express my creativity through my martial arts. But it, it's I think it's cool that... Uh, a lot of these other fighters have other hobbies or other, you know, special talents no one knows about. And it's cool to kind of see you come out of your shell and, and start showing, you know, your paintings and drawings is I think they're great. So I want to know how long have you been painting and drawing? Uh, have you been doing this since a kid? Did you did you go to school for it or uh, what kind of sparked this uh, this coming out and, and showing everybody your little secret skill? Uh, so I started uh, obviously drawing and painting very young. Uh, I was doing it. I think I think my first canvases and stuff I started doing around the age of like 12, 13. I was doing them as like gifts for like my family and everything because, you know, being young didn't have much money or anything and also obviously wanted to put a lot of thought into everything. So like I've never bought a birthday card or a Christmas card or anything. Yeah. Like I've always made them for made them for my family and everything. So, so it kind of kind of like stemmed from that, like trying to be, be like I say, a bit more thoughtful with my gifts and everything. Um, and then kind of with the UFC opportunity, obviously it kind of allowed me to branch out and kind of publicize my my art stuff and get a bit more of like a push behind that. Cause I posted some before and everything, but obviously like, you know, didn't really have much of a following and kind of everyone was just interested in the fighting. So I just felt like it wasn't really like important, but it's kind of almost given me a platform to showcase everything as opposed to just uh, the fact that I'm in the gym all day. Yeah, and I think fans and, and people in general like uh, really enjoy seeing that type of stuff because 
uh, they they want to see your personality. They want to see what you do. Uh, you know, people ask me all the time, like, like, what do you do besides training? Like, uh, not much. Not much yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, but you know, people don't understand that. So, like, when they see uh, our our different personalities or our other hobbies or other things, like, yeah, we're not just you know, we're not just good at punching people or doing submissions. We have you know, we can be good at other things we put our mind to too, and. Like you said, and we talked about before, like having that platform now to actually showcase or uh, put your stuff out there. What's your uh, your drawing and painting page? I know you have a separate page for that. Yeah, it's um, Poppins Dot Paintings. So uh, just you know, Poppins playing on the fight name. Dot Paintings. <laughs> yeah. So check her out. Uh, I think it's super awesome. I've been I've been uh, following and, and keeping a close eye on all your artwork and uh, keep it up because uh, you know creativity is is super cool. Thank you. I appreciate it. So last question for you, Corey, what's your favorite piece you've ever done? Uh, it can be a drawing, a painting, and I want to hear why you did it um, and where you got the inspiration from. Um, so my favorite style technically is like the, I like all the, like the dark art and the tattoos and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I generally like, if I'm drawing for myself, I tend to do a lot of that stuff. Um, but my favorite piece so far is actually, I did like this Monopoly Jiu-Jitsu man for someone. It was a commissioned piece. They requested it. Um, and it ended up just being super fun. I got like a lot of positive reviews from it. And, uh, it's actually, I haven't been able to ship it out yet because it's a really awkward size. Like it's bigger than me. Um, but part of me kind of wants to keep it. I know, I know the guy's probably watching this, so I'm not going to say that. But part of me, like, it sat beside my bed and I'm like, ah. So I might be doing a, a few more of those, maybe make a bit of a series of it. Because that was, that was quite fun to do. Cool. Yeah, I want to see that. I'm going to have to check that out. All right. Next topic we're going to talk about is the Dana White Habib saga. They already met. They've, been, they've actually had a few meetings. And I feel like the talk is, um, is it going to be Connor and Habib? You know, I, I think that's the fight they need to make. You know, we've talked about GSP and Habib, and I think GSP wants that fight, but uh, they haven't been able to work it out yet. Um, so I, I, I want to know what's going on. Is Habib just waiting for his opportunity to, you know, get, get paid the most and maybe fight in Russia or, you know, fight, fight in his homeland? Or is, is he even still the champ? Like, I, I don't know where that 155-pound lightweight division stands right now. Because, you know, you hear he's retired, you hear he's coming back, he's having, you know, meetings with Dana. Like, I think the fans need to know, like, what's happening in the lightweight division. Yeah, he is still listed as the lightweight champ, 155-pound champ. You know, Dana doesn't want to pull him from those rankings. Of course, any fight with Habib now is going to be 1.5 million plus pay-per-view buys. So to the UFC, you know, they're a business. This is something that's going to make him hundreds of millions of dollars, no matter who he's fighting. But... They all know their biggest draw in the UFC is Conor McGregor. So their ultimate goal is to pair up Habib versus Conor for the biggest pay-per-view matchup of, in history of combat sports. That's what they think that could be. Now, I was in Fight Island. I was next to Dana during the Dustin Poirier versus Conor McGregor fight. And it was a somber-ass mood after Conor took that loss. All the executives were in the VIP room. You know, I had the feeling it wasn't the outcome they wanted. And, you know, they wanted to see... Uh, this would be the Ticey matchup for Habib right after that. They met with Habib in Abu Dhabi. So they're really setting things up for him. And it's really, a, you know, they're looking over Dustin a little bit. You know, now they, they got to really credit him as a real matchup. And they're almost doing it again. They're saying, let's rematch in the summer with Dustin versus Connor, And then Connor can fight, can fight Habib after that. They're just assuming the win again, kind of like they did last time. So what do you guys think about that possible matchup with, with Connor and Dustin? And then it going to Habib. And what do you think about, you know, the UFC kind of kind of overlooking for their dream matchup? Yeah, I definitely think they wanted Connor to win. Like let, let, let's be pretty uh, honest here. That's that that was the lead up to that that trilogy or uh, I'm uh that was the lead up to Habib and Connor. And we all know that's the biggest money fight around and the fans want to see the fight. You know, Dana is pushing for that fight. And I don't think Dana White's going to leave Habib alone until, like, Habib's like, all right, Dana, leave me alone. <laughs> you know, because Dana wants that money fight. He's pushing for it. So I, I think that fight needs to happen. Even though, like, Connor lost uh, and, and they're setting up Poirier right away for the rematch, uh, you know, let's see who wins the rematch with Connor and Poirier because I, I think it, it lit a fire under Connor. And now he's, like, he's all, you know, I see him getting really serious about things. And uh, what do you think, Corey? Yeah, I think, like you said, I completely agree with everything you've said. Um, I think the Connor and Khabib fight is obviously, like you said, a very big money fight. So from a business standpoint, it definitely makes sense. 
uh, we see it all the time, like people retiring and then they kind of build that suspense. You know, it's always talks in the work, like, you know, a bit of whispering going around. And then when they do finally come back, obviously they've already got that hype built up. So it's almost like, I think maybe Habib constantly being like, oh, no, no, no. Like it's kind of almost building the anticipation even more. So it's allowing them to kind of build that big money fight. So perhaps the time away will allow them to build, like say the Connor fight a bit more. Yeah, I think you're totally right. Uh, you know, Habib knows what he's doing. Yeah. He, he's a smart guy. He's got a good management behind him. They know how to work. Uh, you know, work work this MMA stuff. You know, they they they, they do a good job. So I think Habib's waiting. He he's he's letting the stock rise. Tell everybody he's retired. Stock went up. You know, then the the meetings and possible uh, Connor fight. They know what they're doing. They're yeah. they're leading up to like a huge multi million dollar event. All right, next topic we're going to talk about is Bruce Buffer celebrates 25 years with the UFC. And uh, this is crazy. His first time was uh, back in UFC, at UFC 8 in 1996. That was like, man, what was I, nine years old? So that's just I, I wasn't I wasn't Yeah, born. you weren't even born I was like, yet. I was minus four. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a lot of respect to Bruce because just, just imagine this, being with a company for 25 years, traveling all over the world, Sometimes leaving your family every weekend. Uh, he, he's got a different suit for every event. So just imagine that guy's closet and how much money he spent on just suits in general. He's even got like a 25th anniversary jacket. So I've always been a big fan of Bruce. He's, he's always been good, good people to me and uh, always talk and said what's up. So I love people that are uh, very uh, personable and um, you know go out of the way to say hello. So I'm a fan of Bruce. He, he'll probably be with the UFC until he can't. He can't, uh, you know, announce anymore. Yeah, I'm lucky enough to be partnered with Bruce and do a lot of collaborations with him on, on video content and with MMA Surge. So I've got to know him over the last year, and he's really become a mentor to me uh, in business especially, but also in life. He's, he's such a unique kind of guy. Um, so, yes, 25 years for him, it's absolutely incredible. He's lived this kind of rock star lifestyle where he says, you know, I pack my briefcase, I lay out my suit, I travel around the world. I always enjoy the casinos that are around and everything that the nightlight has to offer. Of course, yes. you know, throughout, throughout his years, he's getting a little older now, and he tells me behind the scenes he likes to be a little, a little safer when it comes to uh, the party and, and whatnot. But what an incredible experience, incredible life for him, uh, what he's got to do within the UFC. And he says he's got at least a decade left. So a lot of guys are trying, you know, the rumors are that the schmo, the journalist, wants to jump in and do ring announcing, eventually wants to try to take Bruce's spot. There's a bunch of other uh, ring announcers, boxing announcers that are peeking in. And when is Bruce going to retire? When is Bruce going to retire? It's going to be a pretty sad moment, crazy thing, when Bruce does eventually leave the sport. It is, of course, inevitable. Um, so big tribute to Bruce. But though a question for Corey, yeah, she uh, when Bruce started out in this profession, you know, Corey wasn't even born yet, but she's also had the privilege of him announcing her for your fight. And so that's pretty incredible. Corey, how was that uh, being in the ring with, with Bruce Buss, being in the octagon with Bruce as he was announcing your name? Yeah, like you say, Bruce has kind of become like an integral part of the, the UFC. Like you think UFC, like you think of, you know, Bruce Buffer. So um, I definitely think it did make a big difference. You know, I was in there like, and like everything was the same as contenders. Everything was the same as all my other fights. You know, the cage wasn't much different. The the setup wasn't very different. But then like, obviously you got Bruce there, like, you know, and he's, he's doing his little, his little pre-fight speech and it definitely gives it that different atmosphere. And he really does kind of, you know, build the fight regardless of what fight it is, uh, you know, it, lets you know like oh like you've made it like i'm here sort of thing yeah and what other ring announcer has blew out their knee like getting <laughs> into it and showing enthusiasm like announcing somebody that's no impressive. one bruce buffer you're the man <laughs> thanks for watching the fandle mma rundown we'll see you next time